Hello and welcome to the second part of database design made easy. It's time to start normalizing our data model and normalization of course starts with first normal form. For a table to be in first normal form it has to satisfy two criteria. The first of those is that all the values we store have to be atomic values. And a value is atomic when it is not a composite value and not a repeating group. Now this requirement, which is only the first of two requirements for first normal form, but this first requirement is so fundamental to data modeling and to the re whole relational data model that it is sometimes also called zero normal form. But officially it's part of first normal form and that's how I will treat it. Now if you are going to verify whether your columns are atomic, you will quickly find that this is often very much dependent on the universe of discourse. So let's look at an example. Uh, let's start with the composite values. and. I already used the uh, technical conference ID for most of my examples in the previous uh, part. So let's just stay there and let's look at a part of the schedule for the next conference. So we have our sessions, session code DBD102 called Database Design for Beginners presented by me. And we have a session code DBA411 called SQL Server on Linux Internals presented by Bob Smart. And for the record, this is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places and incidents either are products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events, oracles or persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. So, my lawyer is happy again. Okay. We have those names. Hugo Cornelis. Bob Smart. Are those atomic values or composite values? Many people will look at this and say, hey, these are composite values because Hugo Cornelis is a first name and a last name. Bob Smart is a first name and a last name. So for first normal form, we have to separate this into a speaker first name and a speaker last name. But do we? I say this depends on the universe of this course. How are we going to use those names? Are we always going to concatenate first name and last name to print Hugo Cornelis or Bob Smart on everything we print or show on a display? Or are we going to use these to send personalized emails that start with Hi Bob or formal letters? Here is your invoice, Mr. Smart. And then how do we know to use Mr. and not Mrs.? So we probably need more columns. But if we are going to separate a name into a first name and a last name, beware! You are opening a can of worms. Because Many people, especially in the United States, have a middle initial or multiple first names. What about people who have junior or the third as part of their name? How about people from other countries and other cultures? Most Western cultures use the same naming convention and there are many cultures I have no clue about. But for instance, I know that Chinese and some other Asian cultures put the family name first and then the given name. So Mr. Fang Shilong, also known as Jackie Chan, is member of the family Fang and his given name is Shilong. How are you going to store that? Are you going to store Fang in the first name because it's first and then Shilong in the last name? But then your informal Hi Bob becomes Hi Fang, which is weird for someone Chinese. Or are you going to use a surname and given name as columns and then put them in the order we Westerners are used to and address him as Mr. Shilong Fang, which is completely not his name. And 
what if he enters his name using his own language? I would not even know where to separate these characters. What about some universe of discourses where it is normal to use nicknames? For instance, in the gaming culture, people hardly ever use their official name. They use gamer tags. What if someone wants to be called Gamer Girl? And what about this famous pop artist, unfortunately no longer with us, who changed his name to an unpronounceable symbol? Would you really, when he was still alive, have risked losing his clientele because you cannot separate that name into a first name and a last name? If you must, if there is a good reason why you need those first name and last name separately, then you will have to find solutions for all these problems too. But if you just want to people to be able to enter their name, just use a single column, say the name is an atomic value and people can enter their name however they want it, and they will always be addressed with their name as they entered it. So how about the session code? I used these session codes, I modeled them after the session codes I have encountered on a technical conference where I actually was a speaker, and these are actually an encoding of a track, a level, and a session number. So DBD102 is in the DBD track, level 100, and then the second session in that level of that track. Now, if you constantly or often have code that looks at the track or that looks at the level, then you might prefer to have those separate instead of a single session code where you constantly have to do substring or other calls to get a part of the value. But if all you do from this table is put the components together to print DBD 102 because you don't do anything programmatically with those session codes, then why bother? Then it's better to store just that single column. It depends on the universe of this course. It depends on what you do with it. In fact, there might even be cases where you store the session code as a single column and then also store the track and the level. Now, this is something I would typically not do in database design. Because in the data model, I really want to avoid redundancy. But once the data model is complete, we have finished our normalization and we are ready to implement into a relational database or some other data store, then depending on the situation, it may be okay to denormalize the model and actually add those redundant columns. So this is all dependent on the universe of discourse. And if you are creating a new data model for a new application, you have to try to predict how the data will be used. If you are looking at an existing system, you can also look at the code in that system. Are there many queries where the same column is always split in its components? Well, then it's actually a composite value and you should probably store those components separately. However, what if you have multiple columns that are always combined together for a single output value? Well, then they are what I call subatomic. You broke, you, you, decom, you decomposited, or not you, someone decomposited too far and went into too small detail. We're at the quark level instead of at the atom level if you want to maintain the analogy to physics. And you want to combine them and say, we're always combining those columns, let's just store it as a single column. And then, of course, there are judgmental... <laughs> and then, of course, there are judgment calls where some columns are sometimes combined and sometimes used together. Then you have to make your call on 
uh, on what best suits and what is used most of the time. Anyway, enough about composite values. Let's talk about repeating groups. Now, let's return to our example with the uh, schedule for the conference. We have those two sessions and there are of course more as those are two examples. But what if I am not the only speaker on database design for the beginners? What if I want to present that session together with my good friend Kentra Large? We can of course use a comma separated list of speakers in the speakers column. But that would be a repeating group. Now you might also say this is already a composite value and that is correct but if i only say no composite values then i could replace this with a design such as this and now we don't have composite values but we still have a repeating group and this is still a problem look at the model there are three columns for speaker, but we only use one or two in the two sample uh, rows. So we are wasting space. Also, what if someone submits a session with four speakers? Okay, perhaps there is a rule that the maximum can be three, then that problem isn't there. But without that rule, it is. And... You will also find when you work with a model like this that they are very cumbersome to code against. Your queries become nasty. So there are lots of reasons to avoid this, but also to avoid the comma separated list. And the correct solution here is to simply add more rows. If there are five presenters for database design for beginners, simply add three more rows. This is not a completely normalized data model. But we're no longer violating the atomic requirement of first normal form. We'll get to the other normal forms later and see what next has to be done with this table. But for now we are there. Now with this speaker's example it is quite obvious that this design here is always the correct design. But what about a different example? Let's say we're tracking data for employees and we have multiple phone numbers for them on file. A work phone, a home phone and a mobile phone. Again, this is technically a repeating group. But not as, cut, as straight cut as the previous example. Yes, we run into issues when we decide that we also need to add an emergency phone number because we have no column for that. That is a change to the data model, which sucks. We have issues with coding or queries if all we care about is what phone number someone uses or who has a certain phone number. If we specifically look for mobile phone numbers, then this data model doesn't have those issues. But we cannot just store th four rows with employee number, name and phone number because then we lose information. We would have to add an extra column to track the phone type that was previously encoded in the column name. Now both of these models may be the best in a given situation. I cannot predict which is best without knowing the universe of discourse, without knowing the odds that more than those three phone types might be added in the future without knowing what kind of queries to expect. So there is not a single always correct answer here. Both designs may or may not be correct. So those Requirements, no composite values and no repeating groups are both highly dependent on the universe of discourse. Which incidentally makes this part of normalization, the verification of the first 1NF requirement, the hardest part of normalization. Not because the rule is hard to understand, but because it is so dependent on the universe of discourse, you have to think all the time. And that sucks. 
The rest of normalization is a lot easier once you know the functional dependencies because it's a simple, a simple application of rules. After this, we can stop thinking, we just apply rules. However, when we say no composite values and no repeating groups, how about XML data? XML didn't exist when the relational model was designed. So is this a development that invalidates the relational model? Should we refuse to work with XML because the relational model doesn't fit it? No, of course not. Databases are supposed to model reality and when reality changes, we have to adapt. But in this case, the adaptation isn't even that big. We can handle XML. We can also handle JSON. All that kind of data is once more dependent on the universe of discourse. How will the values be used? Do you receive an XML fragment or document from an external source that you need to store and be able to reproduce completely no matter what the contents are? Then it is an atomic value. You can just store it as, an X as a single XML value. Perhaps using the dedicated data type for XML if your relational database system has one and if it satisfies the criteria. For instance, SQL Server stores XML in such a way that when you query it, you get the same content but not the same form. And sometimes legal requirements mean that you should not do that and store it as, for instance, a character string to preserve the exact formatting as you received it. But it might also be that you receive a JSON string and that is just how the data is received, but you care about three or four of the attributes in that JSON string. In that case, it makes way more sense to shred the JSON into its parts and store those attributes. So again, it depends on the universe of discourse, whether XML or JSON data is atomic, uh, a single atomic value or a composite value and or repeating group that needs to be decomposited into atomic values. Use your knowledge of the universe of discourse. Use your knowledge of what the data is going to be used for. How about databases that support the storing of tables inside other tables, the so-called multi-value databases? How do we deal with that? Here, my answer is that is an implementation option. So I would create a data model that still is atomic. So I would not have nested tables in my data model. I want my data model to be independent of the implementation. Even if I already know what database management system I will be using in the end, even if that choice has already been made, I still want an independent data model. And then when the data model is complete, I am going to look at the options I have in my database management system. And if I see, hey, this is a database management system that su supports nesting tables, then there might be areas in my data model where I look at the area and say, hey, this is a good fit for that option, so let's implement it like that. But of course, that's only at the end of database design and not at the start. So in the data model, I would not do this. Bottom line, every column must be atomic and that is highly dependent on the universe of discourse. And this was just the first requirement for first normal form. The second requirement is that every table must have at least one candidate key. In other words, fully duplicated rows are not allowed. Let's return to the conference. Uh, let's design a table for the schedule, but now also add the feedback score that attendees give to a session after attending it. 
So you see, see that my session, Database Design for Beginners, has attracted two feedback forms with a score of 9 out of 10, great, and a score of 6 out of 10. Okay. Bob Smart is indeed very smart, so he obviously received a feedback score of 10 from one of the attendees. But he also received a feedback score of 10 from another attendee. Now we have two rows that are exactly identical. This is not allowed in the relational model. Relational tables do not have an order, so we can never specify the first or the second row of these, because first, second implies an order, but there is no order in this data collection. And we still want to be able to address a single row. If we want to delete one row, and not both, we need to be able, using the values in that table, to uniquely identify that row. That's not possible with this table design, because there is no candidate key on the table. We allow fully duplicated rows. If you encounter this, and if you then take a step back to look at how, what causes this, you will find that the root cause of a table without candidate key is always that you are missing one or more columns. You overlooked something when you collected what columns to store. In this case, what we are missing is actually quite obvious. Who gave that feedback score? If we add that, then we have a table with a candidate key. Because we cannot allow that attendee 128 gives the feedback score of 10 to, data, uh, to DBA 411 two times. In fact, if you look closer, you will see that the actual candidate key is on just the session code and the attendee number. Because attendee 128 can leave only a single score for DBA 411. So, adding that attendee number fixes the problem. We overlooked it, we added it, and now the table is in first normal form. But what if we gather our feedback anonymously. Then we don't know who gave each score and we lose this column that solved a problem. And we have a problem back again. Now if you think about this, once this is anonymous feedback, you don't really care about the distinction between the two rows with identical values. What you care about is that there are two of those rows. So now what we need to do is add a new column that stores how often a specific feedback score was given to that session code. And with that, the issue is fixed. Now we do have a candidate key over the table to be precise over session code and feedback score. Every other column in this table is dependent on this key or a subset of it, a cheater functional dependency. It is dependent on the universe of discourse whether or not the same table is or is not atomic. It is also dependent on the universe of discourse how to fix this. But if you have the functional dependencies, then it is at least easy to see whether the table has a candidate key. And if it isn't, then you may have to do slightly harder work again. So to recapture, a table is in first normal form if every column is atomic, no composite values, no repeating groups, and if the table has at least one candidate key. This is a requirement, this is a test you apply to a single table. Your entire data model can be said to be in first normal form if every table in it is in first normal form or a higher normal form. So the normal form of the data model is the lowest normal form of all the tables in the data model. That concludes the discussion of the first normal form. 
My next video will cover second normal form. If I am fast, it might release late December, but probably early January 2024, the latest, I plan to release that video. If you cannot wait that long, or if you want more in-depth coverage, including a method how to find functional dependencies, check out my course on Pluralsight, and that link is, of course, also below the video. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe or comment. And don't forget to tune back in for the next part of Database Design Made Easy. My name is Hugo Cornelis. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.